Uh, I think if we I look at the gonna, stage. I think we're going to look over at the stage and head back to Liberty University, Lynchburg, Virginia. Donald Trump, after a, an introduction by Jerry Falwell Jr., Donald Trump taking the stage to speak at this convocation to students. <laughs> Let's listen in. Oh, this is so, you get those teleprompters out of here, we're going to have some fun, right? Get those teleprompters. Uh, we have a president, you know, our president, and I'm not talking about this president, I'm talking about that president. We don't like those teleprompters. I will say this, it's an honor to be here, and especially on Martin Luther King Day, we, uh, we broke the record. You know, we had the record for about three or four years the last time. And the first thing I said to Jerry and Becky when I got here, did we break the record? They said, yes, you did, by quite a bit. So we'll dedicate that to Martin Luther King, a great man. And that's a little bit of an achievement, I will tell you. It's an honor to be here. It's an amazing story, what's gone on with Liberty University. I mean, uh, when you think of uh, all of the years, and the early years were not easy. I read a lot about it, and I've watched it. And uh, Liberty University is like a rocket ship, a really great rocket ship. And what Jerry has done, and I knew his father a little bit, and I have to tell you, I, I knew his father a lot from the standpoint of what he did. And to be compared to his father just a little bit, to be compared to his father is really an honor for me. So I want to thank Jerry for saying that. You know, it was very interesting because when other candidates, and everybody wants to come here, they don't have this kind of a crowd, but that's okay. But, but I will say this, uh, when Jerry was telling, you know, nice things about other people, and he was saying, this one's very smart, and this one's good, this one's good, and Trump reminds me of my father. I said, that's the best compliment of all. That's much better than any of the other people got. So I was extremely happy about that, I will tell you. And you should be very proud to be here. You're going to have amazing futures. You're going to have just absolutely amazing futures. Uh, we had a debate recently, and the debate, uh, do, who watched the debate? Everybody? Very political place, okay? But it was an amazing evening for me, and we, uh, we did fine, we did well. And uh, the polls came out right after that, and we keep going up, and we're so happy, and I'm not gonna go over the polls. Somebody said, why do you always discuss the polls? One of the people I'm running against, why do you always? Now, he's in seventh place, I'm in first place. I said, when you're in first place, you discuss polls. It's true. When you're in first place, you discuss polls. But so many things have happened, and, and now they just keep coming out, and we go up and up and up, and we hit 42 last week. 42 percent. That's with 14 or 15 people. You know, they're dropping out rapidly. They're dropping out. When you have 42 percent, at least you know you're not totally wasting your time today, right? 42 percent is good. I think I'd take 42 percent if we had three people, not 14. But it, it has been an experience, and uh, NBC Wall Street Journal just came out. Uh, 33 percent, and CBS, and Owen, uh, let's see, 41 percent, CBS 35 percent, Gravis 44 percent. We're really doing good, uh, it's, so I'm not going to bother you. I will tell you, in South Carolina, we're at 35 percent, way, way, way above anybody else. And in Iowa, CNN was, uh, we're at 33 to 20. So we're way up, and uh, actually some other polls, actually the closest is Iowa, and I love Iowa. And I'm going there right after this, going up to New Hampshire, I'm going to Iowa, because I want to win Iowa. Everyone says, don't say that, don't say you're going to win, just say you're going to do well. That's the closest. But I can't do that. You know, the safe way is to say, oh, I think I'm going to do well. I want to win Iowa, let's see. We've done great. We've done great with the evangelicals. The evangelicals have been amazing. The Tea Party has been amazing, and we're, we're doing really well there. So we'll see what happens, but we're going to give it our best, and I think we could really surprise a lot of people by winning Iowa, and then we're just going to clean the table. We're going to go through New Hampshire, through South Carolina, where we were this weekend. It was amazing. We're going to go right through the whole group, and uh, I think we can do really something special. And we're going to protect Christianity. And I can say that. I don't have to be politically correct. Or we're going to protect it. You know? And I, I asked Jerry and I asked some of the folks, because I hear this is a major theme right here, but 2 Corinthians, right? 2 Corinthians 317. That's the whole ballgame. Where the Spirit of the Lord, right? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, 
there is liberty. And here, there is Liberty College, but Liberty University. But it is so true. You know, when you think, and that's really, is that the one? Is that the one you like? I think that's the one you like, because I loved it. And it's so representative of what's taken place. But we are going to protect Christianity. And if you look what's going on throughout the world, you look at Syria, where they're, if you're Christian, they're chopping off heads. You look at the different places, and Christianity, it's under siege. I'm a Protestant. I'm very proud of it. Presbyterian, to be exact. But I'm very proud of it. Very, very proud of it. And we've got to protect, because bad things are happening. Very bad things are happening. And we don't, I don't know what it is, we don't band together, maybe other religions, frankly, they're banding together and they're using it. Here we have, if you look at this country, it's got to be 70 percent, 75 percent, some people say even more, the power we have. Somehow we have to unify, we have to band together, we have to do really, in a really large version, what they've done at Liberty, because Liberty University has done that. You've band together, you've created one of the great universities, colleges, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, and that's what our, ha our country has to do that around Christianity. So get together, folks, and let's do it, because we can do it. No matter where I go, we're having tremendous crowds, and we're setting records everywhere. We went to uh, Dallas and uh, the Mavericks Arena packed 20,000 people, Oklahoma 20,000 people, Mobile, Alabama 35,000 people. No matter where we go, it's only dictated. Even here, I understand you have rooms all over with the, with the various equipment to show on the screens. You have a much better location than they do, but I won't tell them that. We're just going to cut that off. But we have, <laughs> you have rooms all over with the media equipment. and. No matter where we go, because I will tell you, this is a movement. There's a movement going on. We want to take our country back. Our country is disappearing. You look at the kind of deals we make. You look at what's happening. Our country is going in the wrong direction, and so wrong, and it's got to be stopped, and it's got to be stopped fast. We can't go another four years. I know that maybe Hillary will be here, and if she is, you can play this back. We can't have another four years of Barack Obama. We can't have another four years of Hillary Clinton. We just can't do it. I watched that debate last night with the three of them. I mean, one of them's in there. What's he doing? He keeps mentioning my name. He was the mayor of Baltimore. That was his big claim to fame. Then he became governor because they thought he did a good job. It turned out he did a horrible job. But he's in there constantly mentioning my name. Every, every Donald Trump, Donald Trump. I said, why does he have to talk about me? You know, I look at the job this guy's done. And then the other two, you know, you have a socialist who was here, actually. But you have a socialist, and you have, and I was going to say you have a socialist, could be worse than that, okay? Could be much worse than that. And you have Hillary. And just, if anybody watched that debate last night, what it means is tremendously high taxes. Things are not going to happen with the military. We need to build our military so big, so strong, so powerful, that nobody, nobody is going to mess with us. We have to do it. You know, General Oriana left recently, and he said our military is the least prepared that it's been in generations. The least prepared. We need it more now than we've ever needed it. And I'm in the real estate business. I'm always getting listings. I get listings of different things, bases, an army base, a naval base. They're all, everything's for sale. If it's military, it's for sale. And we can't have that. We're going to build it big. We're going to build it strong. We're, hopefully, we're never going to have to use it. You know, we're going to make it so strong, nobody's going to want to mess. That's really what we have to do. And in the end, that's cheaper than this nonsense we're doing right now, where nobody respects us. They're laughing at us. We don't know what we're doing. We can't beat ISIS. And I see, I see it on television. These generals, they get up and they talk on television. They're being interviewed. I don't want generals to be interviewed. One of the generals just recently, well, what do you think of the ISIS threat? And, oh, they're very tough. They're very, well, can we beat them? Well, it's going to take a long time. I don't want that kind of a general. I want a general where we knock the hell out of them, fast.
And my generals, by the way, they're not going on television, okay? So the enemy can learn all about it. Oh, well, then we attack. How about President Obama recently? We're sending 50 people over there, our finest. What does he have to say that for? Why does he say it? They have a target on their back. They are looking for those 50 people. They're looking for those 50 people right now, more than any other people. What does he have to say it? Why can't he just do it and not talk about it, right? Why can't he do it and not talk about it? When the war in Iraq started, I was very opposed to it, I have to tell you. And I came out and it was very strong that I was opposed to it. And I, now I get, you know, I used to take a little, a little heat on that, but now I get a lot of credit for it. But in 2003, 2004, I said, if you do that, you're going to destabilize the Middle East. It's going to be a disaster. One or the other, whoever we're going to knock out, because we can knock them out pretty easily, uh, is going to take over. The one that's not knocked out is going to take over. So we knock out Iraq. Iran is taking over the Middle East. We have totally destabilized the Middle East. And I said this in 2004. We have totally destabilized the Middle East. It's a disaster. And you look at this new Iran deal, which took forever to get done. You look at how bad it is and how one-sided it is. You look at how one-sided this deal is. And yesterday I heard we're getting our hostages back. Some people call them prisoners. Some people call them hostages. I don't care. So we're getting them back. And then I heard, well, wait a minute. We're paying a big price. They're getting seven back. We're getting actually four. You know, they say five, but the other one they can't find, he's in Iran. I, I tell you what. That's a strange, that's another thing we're going to be looking into. And we're getting, we're getting four back. They're getting seven. They're getting 14 off of the Interpol watch list. These are real bad customers. They're getting all sorts of advantages, including free market oil. They're getting unbelievable advantages. They're going to be an immensely wealthy country and a wealthy terror country. And they're getting $150 billion. So when our sailors were captured last week, I said, that's one of the saddest things that I've seen. When those young people were on their hands and knees in a begging position with their hands up and thugs behind them with guns, and then we talk like it's okay. It's not okay. It's lack of respect. We can't let that happen to this country. It's lack of respect. And we're not going to let it happen to this country. We're going to be strong. We're going to be vigilant. We're going to have powerful borders and strong borders. And look what just happened this morning. I don't know, for any of you that have been seeing the news or reading the news, three people have just been kidnapped in Iraq because they see, what the heck? We pay $150 billion for four people, three people just this morning, and this is going to take place all over. They should have come back as part of the deal three years ago when they started talking about the deal. Not now. Not now. And what should have happened, what should have happened is our representatives — first of all, we needed people that negotiate properly, not a guy like Kerry, who doesn't have a clue. But — and we will have those people. I know those people. We will have those people. But when you look at what went on, our people, all you had to do is go in and say to the Persians, very good negotiators, great negotiators, legendary negotiators. They're known for it. They're sitting across the table. Fellas, and in this case, it is all fellas. I hate to tell you to this to the women. They're behind the fact. They're a little behind the fact. They haven't figured out that women maybe in certain ways are much better than men, but I don't want to say that because I'll get myself in trouble with men. But they haven't figured this out yet, but that's okay. You say, fellas, we want our prisoners back. Got to have them back. Does it help you? Helps us. We'll make a better deal. The United States, the people, they want them back. They're talking about them. We want our prisoners back. Got to give them back. They'll say no. And we'll say, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Bye-bye. Get up. Leave the room. Now you double up the sanctions. Within 48 hours, they will call and they'll say, we want our prisoners back. And here's your prisons. And now, you go in a second time. You don't mention this. You say, listen, the other thing I had to tell you, but I didn't want to tell you before we got our prisoners back, we're not going to give you any money. No money. We don't have it. We're a debtor nation. We owe $19 trillion. We're not going to give you any money. And you want to be nice. You don't want to put it in their face. Just say, look, we're a poor nation. We've been mismanaged. We've been misrun. We don't know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> right? 
Is that true or what? This isn't Jerry running our nation, that I can tell you. But we've been mismanaged. We don't know what we're doing. We have 19 trillion in debt, going to be 21 because that ridiculous budget that was approved last week, which got approved so fast, that's going to add another two trillion. So we're going to be 21 trillion dollars. So he said, we can't, we can't give it to you. Don't have it. Sorry. And they'll probably be upset, but don't worry about it. A week will go by, they'll say, let's start negotiating. So you could have saved, you could have gotten the prisoners out years ago for nothing, for nothing, without giving them these people who, by the way, deserve to have been in prison. These were serious. And the Interpol people, forget it. These are bad dudes. These are bad people. So they made, like, this incredible deal. But everybody makes good deals with the United States because the world is smart, and they use their smart people, and they use their most cunning, streetwise people, and they know what they're doing. We have people that don't know what they're doing. We want to be politically correct, like Jerry Sr. would say, politically correct. We want to be politically correct. And it's just not working. And I think one of the reasons that people are showing up for me and the poll numbers are all showing up for me, it's not that I can't be. I went to a great school, Ivy League school, all of that stuff. Did well, smart guy. I even had an uncle. You know, if you don't, but I had an uncle who was a professor at MIT for decades, brilliant guy, Dr. John Trump. We can all be politically correct. It takes too much time. It takes too much time. <laughs> And a lot of it's just wrong. I'll give you an example. You go into a department store now, right? When was the last time you saw Merry Christmas? You don't see it anymore. They want to be politically correct. If I'm president, you're going to see Merry Christmas in department stores, believe me. Believe me. You're going to see it. You're going to see a lot of things. You're going to see Beyond, you're going to see a lot of things. But that's one example. You go shopping today, you don't see it anymore. You hardly see anything. You see, I have a wall that's painted red. Oh, great. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> we're going to be saying Merry Christmas again. And we're going to be saying Happy Holiday for the... And I have friends that aren't Christian. They like to say Merry Christmas. They, they love it. Everybody loves it. But we've taken it out of the vocabulary. It's not going to happen, okay? Thank you. I love you, too. Thank you. That was very nice. That was very nice. That was very warm, actually. Sometimes you never know who's shouting. You never know. It's somebody. You know, it's sort of interesting. When I go to the rallies, we had one the other day, about 16, 17,000 people. The arena was packed. And I'd go home and I'd say to my wife, darling, how did you like the speech? Oh, it was good. How many people were there? I said, what do you mean? Didn't you didn't see it? No. And I say it all the time. They focus on my face. They never, ever, ever show the crowds. So she'll say, how many? Now, it sounds like a roar, because, you know, when you have a lot of people like this, it sounds like a roar. But she'd say, how many people were there, darling? I'd say, the place was packed. It had to have 15, 18,000 people. In one case, we had 15, and we sent away seven because they couldn't get into the arena. I said, you didn't see that? No. They focus on your face. They never show. But the thing I love about the protesters, and I thought the cameras were, like, in a fixed position. They don't move, right? You know, what do I know about this stuff? So I figured they were fixed. You can't move. Except. Every time there was a protester screaming about something, those cameras could be like a pretzel. They'd turn around, and <laughs> I never saw anything like that. And I love the protesters. We don't have many, honestly. But I love the protesters, because if there's a protester up in that corner, the cameras would go up there, and people would say, they wouldn't talk about the protesters. They'd say, boy, that place was packed. I said, that's right, because it's a movement. It's packed. But you wouldn't see. Because the press, and I have to say this, is very, very dishonest. Now, not all of it, but most of it. Very dishonest. Very, very dishonest. And uh, I've never seen, actually, I've never seen anything. I've seen financial press, and, and they play games, but, you know, the numbers are numbers. But with this press, this political press is brutal. Now, 25% are good. 2% are great, okay? That's not acceptable. Do we agree? 2% is not acceptable. But the press is very dishonest, like the camera trick. I call it the camera trick, where they don't show. So what's happening, and what's happening in the country, is you're not getting a real picture of the silent majority, which Jerry Sr. had something to do. And that's a phrase you should be really cognizant of. Because it is a silent majority, but I think I'm going to up it a little bit, because it's no longer so silent. It's really a noisy majority. It's become a noisy majority. People want to see greatness for our country. They want to see things happen. 
They want to see things happen, and they're not seeing it. These politicians are all talk. They're no action. They don't get it done. When I say we're going to build a wall, they all say, wall? What are you talking about? You can't build a wall. Of course you can build it. Simple. China. China. <laughs> Think of it. China. 2,000 years ago, China built the Great Wall of China. This is a serious wall. And they didn't have Caterpillar tractors or, as we say, Komatsus, because so many are coming out of Japan. We have to stop that now, by the way. But they didn't have the, the equipment, and they built a wall. Think of this. 13,000 miles long. And this is a serious wall, okay? This wall is wide. This is like this, and this is a serious wall. So then we hear, you can't build a wall. I say, not only can I build it, and the guys that I'm talking to on the stage are saying, you can't build a wall, can you? Because they don't know anything. They don't know how to fix the infrastructure. Our bridges are crumbling. Our roads are crumbling. We spent $5 trillion in the Middle East. And our country is going to hell. We got to bring it back. We got to knock the hell out of ISIS. By the way, by the way, by the way, so I didn't want to go into Iraq, but I didn't want to get out the way we got out. Because what happened and I was always saying, I've said this for years. I might have said this the last time I was here, years ago. Take the oil. Take the oil. Keep the oil. You know, in the old days, to the victor belong the spoils. To us, we go in and fight. We lose trillions of dollars. We lose thousands and thousands of unbelievable people. We have wounded wars who I love all over the place. We get nothing. Look at Iraq. What do we get? Nothing. And Iran now takes over Iraq. I always say, Iran made the greatest deal with 150 billion. What a great deal, what a great deal. Two weeks ago, it came to me. That deal's nothing. They made the really greatest deal. They took over Iraq. They've been fighting for Iraq for ever, under different names, but they've been fighting. And they were the same militarily. They'd fight and fight and fight. They'd go 10 feet left, 10 feet right, left, right, then they'd rest. Then Saddam Hussein would drop gas, and people would say, it's unfair, they'd stop, the whole thing. This went on forever, and it would have gone on forever. But we decapitated one. Now, so what did we give Iran? We gave them the 150 billion, the great deal and all that, and they're gonna have, by the way, they're gonna have nuclear weapons. They don't have to develop them anymore. They can buy them, they have so much money. They'll do what they want to develop them for. How about this? We see something wrong or we think there's something wrong. So we have to wait 24 days before we go in. But before the 24 days start, there's a whole procedure. So who knows how long it could be? It could be six months. So something's going on. But the other one is even better, because in certain locations, it's called self-inspection. They have the right to self-inspect. So we call up and we say, listen, we hear you're building nuclear weapons over here. We want to go in. Oh, no, no, you don't have the right. But we'll self-inspect. We'll go in. Call up the next, no, no, nothing's happening over there. Oh, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Now we feel much better. <laughs> These are the deals we make. Sergeant Bergdahl, anybody ever hear of Sergeant Bergdahl? We get Sergeant Bergdahl, a dirty, rotten traitor. Six people died going after him. Six people died going after Sergeant Bergdahl. We get Bergdahl, they get five of the great killers that they've wanted for the last nine years. So we get Bergdahl, a traitor, and we knew he was a traitor before the deal because they had a general and a colonel talking to the people that he was with. So we knew he was a traitor. Who would make deals like this? Who does it? S Obama. <laughs> Stand up. I like that. Boy, you are, that was very good. That was good timing. That, thank you. I love it. He's right. And I didn't want to say it because it's a little bit rough, but if he says it, that's okay. <laughs> now Obama is a disaster. And you look, take a look at our trade deals. These are deals that are the worst. We're going to lose $500 billion trade deficits with China. With Japan, $100 billion. We're talking about a year. How do you have a country and then they say, well, Trump doesn't believe in free trade. No, I want free trade, but I want it to be like, at least we break even, right? We do something. <laughs> but how do you lose the kind of numbers? And remember, they don't play by the rules. And I love China, by the way. 
I deal tremendously with China. I own a big chunk of the Bank of America building in San Francisco through China. I have apartments all over, condos, through China. Uh, so much through China. I buy, I do great business with China. They're fantastic. They're unbelievable. In fact, my daughter's here. Where's Ivanka? Where's Ivanka? Stand up, Ivanka. Anybody ever hear of Ivanka? Ivanka deals with China all the time, and we deal with Mexico, and Mexico's great. We, I have great relationships with Mexico, with the Mexican people. I have thousands of people from Mexico and Hispanic people. These are great people. They're unbelievable. But their leaders are too smart for our leaders. They're too cunning for our leaders. And you look at what they're doing, not only on the border, but with trade. Nabisco from Chicago. No more Oreos, folks. Nabisco is moving to, they're moving their big plant from Chicago, they're moving it to Mexico. Ford is building a two and a half billion dollar plant in Mexico. That's not gonna happen. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say, folks, we gotta stop this. We're losing our jobs. We're losing our manufacturing jobs. I go to schools, and less so here because it's so good, I go to very good colleges and I see students. And they're, they're borrowed up to the neck, everything. The biggest problem is, they graduate, they, they study, they work, they do well, they get good marks. They're really wonderful, they're proud of themselves. Then they can't, they come out, they can't get a job. We gotta create jobs. We gotta bring back the jobs from China. We gotta bring back the jobs from Japan and all these countries that are ripping us off. And we're gonna do that. And we're going to do that. And just like I say, okay, so I say, who's going to build the wall, folks? You tell me. Who's going to build the wall? M Mexico. Everybody knows. I say that again. They say, oh, you can't build a wall. So, so easy. You have no idea. And the reason it's easy, and uh, it is. For me, it's, I just built a 92-story building. I mean, when you build buildings, building a wall, it's called like, give me some prefab plank. Being... And I gotta make it, but I really, but I really, I have to make it look beautiful. Why? Because someday they'll name the wall Trump Wall, and I gotta have it. <laughs> and by the way, we want people to come in, but we want people to come into our country legally. They'll go through a process. They'll go through a process. But one of the people I'm running against, I won't use names because we don't want to insult anybody. And this is really such nice religious people. I love it. Such great Christians. I can't say bad. Am I allowed to say bad in this room? No. Okay. So here's the thing. I wouldn't say that. But the other day, for the first time I heard it, one of the folks said, we're going to build a wall. I said, what? What's going on? I just heard him say he's going to. Nobody said that before. So they're all coming my way, you know? They're all coming my way. The only problem is they don't know where to begin. They wouldn't know where to begin. And it'll be one of these walls, not one of those walls. See the side of that ceiling? If you got up there, if you got up there, you're on the other side, you're gonna be really scared coming down. This is a serious wall. And we can do it for the right price. And it doesn't matter because, again, I don't know if you saw Saturday Night Live where they said the wall. But the wall, did everybody see? A lot of people saw that. But, but, just so you understand, the reason they're going to pay, and the reason it's easy for a businessman to understand this, very easy. Mexico is making a fortune on the United States. Now, China, I love them. They're great. I'm not holding it against China. They're the largest bank in the world, a Chinese bank, is a Chinese bank. It's a tenant of mine. I don't hold that against them. Mexico. I don't hold it against Mexico. You see what's going on with the crime and all that. I don't hold that against Mexico. If they can get away with it, if their politicians can do it, I hold it against our very stupid leadership in this country. That's what I hold it against. I don't hold it against these other countries. I mean, if they can get away with it, let them do it. Well, I want to get away with things. I could go into story after story after story, and I used to use the word incompetence. But it's not strong enough, you know? And then I use the other word. You know the word I'm talking about, right? I use that word, and then they say, he's plain spoken. My education's too good to be called plain spoken. I'm not that plain spoken, you know? I wrote The Art of the Deal. I wrote many bestsellers, like The Art of the Deal. Everybody read The Art of the Deal. Who has read The Art of the Deal in this room? Everybody. I always say, I always say, a deep, deep second to the Bible. The Bible is the best, the Bible. 
The Bible blows it away. There's nothing like the Bible. But the art of the deal was uh, about, in fact, there are a few of them right over there. But the art of the deal was the best-selling business book. And Obama didn't read it, and Kerry didn't read it. But we can do things with our country that will be so good. But I've always used that word, incompetent. They're incompetent. Now I, I don't care anymore. I don't care. Again, I'm not being funded by these guys from Wall Street that have, you know, they own, as Jerry, he called them puppets. It's true. I'm doing, I'm self-financing my own campaign. I'm not taking funds. Is that nice? So we can do what's good for the country. In other words, we are going to do what's good for the country. And I tell people all the time, and use Ford as an example. You could use Nabisco. I could use a hundred companies. And by the way, you have a lot of corporate inversion going on, which is going to be beyond Mexico. You have companies leaving the United States right now because taxes are too high and lots of other things. And you have they're leaving. It's called corporate inversion. It's a disaster. They're leaving for lower taxes and because they can't bring their two and a half trillion dollars back into the country. They just can't do it. But take Ford, and I use this as an example. It could be anybody. It could be any company that goes into other countries. But take Ford going in. Two and a half billion dollars. So they're taking a lot of stuff out of Michigan. They're taking a lot of, they're closing other things, and they're going to build this massive thing. Who ever heard of two and a half billion dollars for a one-story building? You know how big that is? So they're going to make cars, trucks, and parts. So I don't care about Ford. In fact, the president of Ford wrote me a very nice letter trying to explain, you know, that it was a good thing. I said, it's not a good thing, but that's okay. When I'm president, I can say it even much stronger. Right now, I don't care, okay? But he wrote me a nice letter. Good company, run very well. Good product. I love Ford. I love Chevrolet. I love all our products. We want to buy USA, right? But they wrote me, and I said, here's a story. If, let's say, uh, a stiff like Jeb Bush is president, okay? Let's say he's... <laughs> no, he's actually... No. Let's say Jeb Bush is president, okay? Low energy person, but that's okay. Let's say Jeb becomes president. Look, Jeb is president. Now, they'll go to him. He has $128 million that he got from donors, special interests, uh, everybody, lobbyists. So Ford will hire one of the lobbyists. You know, they'll say, look, I know this game better than anybody. I've been playing this game for a long time, folks, on the other side. I changed sides. You know, I was total establishment. Now I'm like the worst thing that ever happened to the establishment because I understand the game. So now they go to, let's say, Jeb. They say, Mr. President, uh, this is a very bad thing. Well, I agree it's bad. I agree it's bad. We have to do this. We can't allow this to happen. And then he's going to get a call from his lobbyist or his special interest. Mr. President, they gave you $5 million. You can't not make this deal. Well, did they? Another one's going to call. Mr. President, they gave you $2 million. You got to take care of Ford. All right, I'll do it. Okay. That's the end. We lose the jobs. We lose all the different things. With me, they're going to call. And by the way, Hillary, just as bad, even worse. Hillary, they'll call. They're going to call Hillary. And they're going to say, Madam President. By the way, I want to see a woman president soon, but not her. She's a disaster. She's a disaster. She's a disaster. I mean, just think of the corruption and the scandal. We don't want to go through it. You just don't want to go through it. We want to see winning. We want to see win, win, win. I always joke, I say, we want to see win, 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 constant winning. And you'll say, if I'm president, and you say, please, Mr. President, we're winning too much. We can't stand it anymore. Can't we have a loss? And I'll say, no, we're going to keep winning, 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 because we're going to make America great again. And you'll say, okay, Mr. President, okay. But they'll call Hillary with Ford, right? They'll call Hillary. And they'll say, Man, and she'll do the same thing because her donors gave her a lot of money. And they need the money for the next election. By the way, the only time the politicians really sort of work right is when they're sort of like retiring, like the gentleman over there, the congressman. Now, he's a young guy. He retired of his own volition because he knows what's going on in Washington, which I have great respect for. But some of them retire, then they get a little bit tougher. But with Ford, you take a look. Now, they call them, Ford moves in. They call Trump. Okay, now it's President Trump. Okay, President Trump. So, <laughs> so they call President Trump. 
And they say, Mr. President, I mean, you have to do this. Ford has been great and wonderful. I say, what are they building in Mexico for? What do we want them building in Mexico? They're going to build, remember this, cars, trucks, and parts. They're going to sell them across the border, no tax. So you say, we're all smart people. How does that help us? We close plants and we open new plants in Mexico and they sell and there's no tax. So they're going to say, no, 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 we're going forward. I'll say, here's the story. If you go forward, that's fine. But for every car, truck, and whatever else you're building, you are going to pay a 35 percent tax every time it crosses the border. We have to, or we're not going to have a country left. Everyone's ripping us. Everyone's ripping us. Now, I don't want to do that because I'm a free trader. I want free trade. But we got to be sort of like smart here, folks, because we've lost seven, eight, and some people say 10 million jobs. We've lost 50,000 manufacturing plants. We're getting killed. And the quality of our jobs is terrible. You saw that in the last report. They have this phony number, 5.2 percent. Everybody that quits looking for a job is considered statistically a person that has a job. It's a phony number. You're probably real numbers like 22, 23 percent. There you have it, Donald Trump speaking at Liberty University, (laughs) and uh, sounds like a stump speech. Working up a sweat right there. In some ways, it was the standard stump speech. In other ways, he seemed to cater a little bit to the crowd. Our Jim Acosta in the House right now, and Jim, I'm curious. There were times it really seemed like he had the crowd eating out of his hand. There were other times it was quiet for an extended period. What's it been like being there? You know, uh, some of his biggest applause lines uh, here at Liberty University were when he attacked other candidates in this race, when he said, I want to see a woman president too, but not Hillary Clinton. I think that was the biggest applause line of this entire speech so far. But he has catered uh, some of his remarks uh, to this Christian conservative audience. He talked about how, you know, he was talking about his book, The Art of the Deal, and he says it's, it's a deep, deep second to his favorite book, which is the Bible. Uh, also talked about how if he's president of the United States, we're going to go back to saying Merry Christmas. Uh, he even quoted a little bit of scripture at the beginning of, uh, of this speech. So uh, Donald Trump tailoring his comments somewhat to this, uh, this audience here. But, you know, one thing that is not, uh, not in the speech so far, at least, he has not gone after Ted Cruz, his arch rival in Iowa, uh, who he is vying uh, to, to win that Iowa caucuses with. Uh, you know, uh, Ted Cruz is his main competition in Iowa. We know that Ted Cruz's base of support in Iowa is with evangelical voters. And so far, Donald Trump may be deciding here that it might be wise to sort of go around Ted Cruz at this event, not go after Ted Cruz as strongly as he has on the stump lately, and, and perhaps get out of here uh, just speaking to the audience here. But it, it is sort of the typical speech we hear from Donald Trump. He went after the media, accusing us of not showing us, uh, showing our viewers the crowd size uh, at his rallies, despite the fact that, yes, we have taken some what we call bump shots during this event and showed the crowd size here. Uh, it is it is filled uh, to capacity at this uh, at this basketball arena. And, you know, Donald Trump, uh, you know, he, he doesn't hold back at one point calling Bo Bergdahl a dirty, rotten traitor. Uh, you know, that kind of uh, even even though we're in a Christian conservative crowd, that kind of red meat is firing up this audience here. He also said he's going to knock the hell out of ISIS. Uh, so even though he is tailoring his remarks somewhat to the audience, this evangelical crowd here, we've heard a lot of the same stump speech lines from Donald Trump that we typically hear out on the campaign trail, guys. One of his one of the big applause lines that we just heard recently there was when he was bl- b- taking on Hillary Clinton and blasting her. We'll see um, what more Donald Trump has to say. We're going to keep an eye on that and we'll see if maybe Ted Cruz is the only candidate that he doesn't take on in front of this crowd. We'll see. Jim Acosta is there. Unscathed. Keeping That's an eye. Right. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Jim Acosta is watching it for us. We're keeping an eye out there. We will be right back after this.